Hello and welcome all of you to our Quilters Question Time live question and answer session for March 2024 and we are officially in spring here in the Northern Hemisphere so that means autumn in the Southern Hemisphere but a beautiful time of year for all of us. We've just been looking at where you are watching from and just about everybody in the UK has said it's raining so I couldn't resist the opportunity to say it's not raining here, sorry there's a fly, a little fly, it's not raining here um, and start with that good old British subject of the weather. So I'm going to pass you over to David and I have to say to you David's feeling quite poorly. Um, we were filming today and he had to go home after lunch. He didn't eat all of his lunch. He refused cake and went home and, and slept and we weren't sure whether we were going to be able to continue but he has uh, assured me that he can last for an hour before he has to go home and crash. So here's David. So here we are, what a trooper, eh? what a trooper. So lots of people um, online. I love this about um, YouTube that we can see everybody. So I think Joyce Cassie, you got the award for the first person uh, to make a comment, but then Shirley Yule from a wet Sussex, Rianne Newton from wet Wales. <laughs> um, lots of people calling in from wet places, um, Southern California, um, we've got somebody from, um, I've lost, lost it now, somebody from um, Canada, so we've got people from all over. So hopefully you can hear us loud and clear and um, we can get started. So we've got a fantastic range of questions tonight. We've got about 30 questions, so that's two minutes per question without even my <laughs> chat in between. So we're going to have to um, get through them pretty fast. We haven't got Peter with us this evening. For those of you who've never joined us before, Peter, my husband, always makes an appearance. But he last week he said to me, did I want to go and see a, a theatre production in a working men's club in a working class area of Hull, which is our, our nearest big city? And I said yes to that, and he bought the tickets. And then I realised it was tonight and we had a live, so he's had to go off on his own. So I'm sure he's having the most <laughs> marvellous time. <laughs> Poor man. Anyway... So for those of you that don't know, our members are eligible to, for a prize draw and we always have two small gifts to give to our members. You don't have to do anything, you are, just have to be a member and Peter usually draws the numbers out so that we can have the, uh, the joy of choosing the winners. So for this evening, I have got four beautiful fat quarters for one lucky winner and if we send you a gift sort of directly from the studio here, here in Yorkshire then you get my postcards and a signed postcard to wish you congratulations. Sometimes we send things directly from um, a, a retailer because it just makes more sense so that is one and then the other one has got some nice bits and pieces in it so of course the wonderful postcards and some people think they're more exciting than anything else which I am not sure about. There is an embroidery hoop, there are three types of needles, two John James needles and the most exciting one are some huge tapestry needles that are size 13 so you could use those for corded trapunto or elastic anything but some other needles some gorgeous 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 karen k buckley perfect pins extremely fine beautiful pins and then one of my most favorite tools the general's charcoal white marking tool which is fantastic on dark fabrics so i'm afraid i I don't think you get to choose which gift um, but anyway so I'm going to take two numbers out of my special number bag and I'm going to pass those over to David there is what it doesn't matter if I see the numbers because I've absolutely no clue who they correspond to so um, Thank you. there you go David yep. okay so later on we will let you know who the two lucky winners are so we should get cracking with questions and uh, we need a timer David or then you go beep that's enough move on 
Okay, I will try to look stern if Philippa takes too long, so, uh, but we'll, we'll see how it goes. So the first question is from Joan Walker, um, and Joan says, um, I'm not sure if this is the appropriate means to request that you consider addressing the topic of quilt piecing on 5mm versus 9mm sewing machines. So, so Philippa, what can you tell us about 5mm versus 9 Okay, and so David, out of the corner of my eye, because I'm looking at the camera, if you start to do this, like roll it on, I might kind of notice. Okay, so I will try and answer this as succinctly as possible. So, 9mm wide feed dogs to allow for the needle to have a wide throw to do wide satin stitch, wide buttonholes, blanket stitch, that kind of thing. 5.5mm obviously much narrower. Now whatever those two, uh, we, uh, she said she's trying to do it succinctly and can't, okay. For most sew machines or for some sew machines you can get different stitch plates so you will pr be provided whichever machine you buy with a stitch plate that the hole that the needle goes down into will be a long oval shaped hole to allow for the throw from left to right when you are doing decorative stitches but you can often also buy a straight stitch plate which has a small round hole so my preferred machine for piecing is the 5.5 mil with a straight stitch plate because there is less play of the work as it goes through the sewing machine and the sewing machine foot clamps to the feet and holds the work much more successfully. So there's less movement as it goes through because simply there isn't the hole for the work to get pushed down or kind of moved around and the foot holds onto the plies of fabric as it takes the work through. So I have both sewing machines, I have a 5.5 and a 9 mil and this is the 5.5, it's the one that I use most often. Did actually mention this in the last uh, um, live session if I had to get rid of one which one would I choose to keep I'd keep the 5.5 and I would get rid of the 9 mil because that would allow me more control and then I would come up for creative ways of making embroidery stitches or decorative stitches so two rows of satin stitch instead of one wide one that kind of thing so hopefully Joan that was within time and that answers your question so if you're thinking of buying one it's tricky which do you go for Okay, thank you. Hopefully that helps there, Joan. Um, the next question is from Judy Pryke, and we've got a picture that goes along with this. Um, and Judy says, um, I was practicing ready for a project using 40 weight thread in the bobbin and kimono silk in the top. Using blanket stitch, the bottom thread was just straight thread that pulled out. I tried threading through the hole in the bobbin finger, but it made no difference. I changed the bottom line in bobbin and kimono silk for the thread and it was just the same. Please could you tell me what I'm doing wrong as I've done blanket stitch many times but never with these threads. And then Judy you followed up with another um, mention you apparently tried Aurafil and it seemed to fix it but you said that you'd been using stitch and tear when trying the first stitching for the first query. So Philippa, what's going on here? Okay, yeah, so there's quite a lot of variables there, aren't there? Um, so let's start with the first one. So that is the blanket stitch with a very fine 100 weight silk thread in the top and a much more robust, thicker thread in the bobbin. And um, Judy doesn't say whether that is a polyester thread in the bobbin or a cotton thread. And I've tried to look at it in the picture and I wonder if the bobbin thread is cotton cotton because uh, I can't see any sheen to it so I'm just guessing there okay so I think it's perfectly acceptable to mix types of threads so cotton with silk and silk with polyester and so on but you do need to keep the weight of the thread similar so that so the very heavier or the much heavier um, uh, thread in the bobbin especially if it's if it's cotton which is very inelastic polyester thread and silk thread to some degree is more elastic it will just say in a straight line and it'll pull that very fine thread down underneath and so it really isn't a good kind of balancing act so and I also wonder that stitch and tear is stabilizing the, the fabric and it's making it even kind of stronger and allowing that very fine silk thread to be pulled to the underside okay um, so and 
then though um, Judy moved to uh, bottom line in the bobbin and kept the silk in the top and bottom line is a 60 weight bobbin thread so a much finer thread than she started with in the bobbin initially and the, that combination is a combination that I have used often um, so I'm a little unsure having said that I can't really think apart from in miniature quilts where I've ever um, really used blanket stitch using kimono silk in the top the really fine kimono silk because one of the things that I want with blanket stitch is for it to kind of show up and so the kimono silk is not going to really tell much of a story in terms of the stitch because it's very discreet so um, so um, I think that really requires um, looking at your tension settings and I know that she has looked at her tension setting but she needs to um, tighten the top tension maybe loosen the bottom tension so if you tighten in the top tension it stops it being pulled down so easily if you loosen the bottom tension it will come up a little bit and it won't drag the top thread down and then um, moving to the orofil which generally the orofil that most quilters use is a 50 slash 2 cotton so it's kind of medium finish medium weight cotton top and bottom nicely matching um, and cotton thread I have to say it is inelastic but it's a bit more grippy um, so a, a shiny polyester or a silk will glide through um, more easily because it's a smoother thread it's made from longer filaments and it's got a sheen to it so many variables there um, to kind of play with and I have to say not all sewing machines like all threads so you may just you know do lots of things and find that um, it's not working how your threads feeding off can make a difference all sorts of things so um, in terms of what I know um, from what you've told us Judy and the time that we've got available uh, my main thing to say would be really balance your threads in terms of weight even if it's not the same fiber and yes you will need to change your tension top and bottom we have lots of information on tension in philippa's foundations yeah. which is on gmqt so gmqt.co.uk go to the home page look for philippa's foundations and there's lots of information on tension and many other things there and it's free for all you don't have to be a member to access philippa's foundations okay thank you um so the next question um we've got two questions very similar uh, one from bernadette pitt and one from esther jocelyn and they're both about washing fabrics before we start to quilt um, bernadette says is it best pra practice to wash your fabrics before you start a quilt she says she's been told yes and no so <laughs> maybe wash them a little bit i don't know um, also what's the best way to clean your quilts and then esther kind of went on and said do you use layer cakes or charm packs charm packs um, and do you pre-shrink your quilt batting or wadding so that they're all kind of similar sorts of questions how do you what was a bazillion questions within those two questions so really at the end of the day it's whatever works for you so the people that don't wash their quilts i think the reason sorry don't wash their fabrics i think one of the reasons they might decide not to wash their fabrics is that if there's any kind of finish or sizing on there washing it gets rid of it and if the fabric is a bit firmer and it's not of a hugely fantastic quality a bit open weave which lots of quilting fabric is um, it's going to be more stable and fray less but i personally like to wash on a gentle cycle just with some uh, some laundry um, and um, not very much detergent at all to um, pre-shrink and also just check there isn't any color running so yes I do pre-wash all of my fabric if I don't buy charm packs um, generally or layer cakes I have had them for samples um, class samples in the past because it gives you a lot of fabric to um, make samples with but if I did want to wash those then I would just soak them in water no detergent um, and once they had soaked I would take them out I would place them on a towel and then put another towel on top and then walk on it get some water out of there don't do it in your stocking feet because you get wet feet and then I would um, just uh, spread them out to dry I never put anything in the dryer really um, because I just think it's too harsh I don't put any of my clothes in the dryer unless I absolutely have to you know all of that lint that you is in your dryer is your fabric so you know um, you are getting rid of it by doing that I just think it just it wears things out too quickly 
Um, so that's what I do. Um, yes, I pre-soak my wadding or batting to shrink it. It does actually shrink cotton um, wadding or batting. 100% cotton will shrink by about three to four inches if it's 90 inches wide to start with. I have tried that. Um, soaking it so that it's not agitated and it re retains its stability. Um, some very soft things like bamboo can easily go into holes if they are, are washed and they are not kind of encased in the layers of a quill and held with quilting stitches um, and then I um, spin them and or spin the batting or wadding and then I have one of those old-fashioned wooden pulley drying systems with six um, big slats and I drape the um, the wet wadding or batting over those slats and air dry it so again I don't um, tend to put it in the dryer. Um, what Pre-soaking your batting, you're taking care of shrinkage, you're fluffing up the surface, you're making it softer, it needles better and a fluffier surface holds the lace together when you are doing your quilting. So was there anything else I needed to add on that? Oh, how do you clean your quilts? wash them as little as possible, turn them round. So if they're rectangular, go top to bottom. If they are square, turn them round. I'm gonna let you into a secret here. I don't like to let my husband change the bed, okay? It's, I'm like the princess in the pea. I am really, really fussy. But what he does is, oh, we have blankets. I love sleeping under wool blankets. He'll he'll move the blankets kind of to the end of the bed, but still keep them tucked under. He'll take the sheets out and then he'll try and put the sheets in without moving the blankets or the, um, the bedspread. And so if you continually do that, they're always in the same direction. I'm always turning them round. And when I take them off, I turn them round so I know exactly which way I'm going. So yes, I am extreme in many ways but look after your fabrics look after them and um, they will repay you with long life so if you do have to wash them very gently and I would always suggest you sponging any bits um, that need a little bit of um, attention before you actually do wash them and um, yeah just be really careful with detergents because I did have a dress that I washed with a well-known brand of um, soap powder and it's really not the color out of it and I'm very disappointed so um, I actually found that cheaper um, washing detergents can be less harsh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right, I'm going to move on. I'm going to move on at that point. Yeah, I'm not doing very well, am I? <laughs> so Two somebody minutes. said I was crackly, so I've switched my microphone. I'm just checking with the headphones on to make sure that you can hear me through this one. So sorry about that. Um, I get the old dodgy microphone, so I've taken it off and I'm just using the one on the camera now. So the next question is from Fiona Margaret Sherwood. Um, and Fiona says, um, please can you help with hints on using iron-on products, i.e. interfacing H640 um, in R form by Bosal, etc. Never sure how to do it. Should steam be used or any other tips, please? I'm going through a phase of bag and pouch making, um, hopefully to pass on to various charities to help with fundraising. And that's from Fiona Margaret Sherwood. So Fiona, well done. You are doing some lovely things for people, which is very kind of you. Now then, I just happen to have in my small <laughs> stash of things, I mean, goodness me, I could set up a shop in here, couldn't I? Um, some very similar product. This is Violene H630, which I imagine is a slightly different weight. And I did just look to see what was comparable. And for those of you in the States, it's very similar to Pelon, Pelon Thermolam Plus. Okay, so it is a slightly kind of woolly looking um, interfacing that is fusible on one side. And so it's going to add warmth and a bit of body to anything you use it um, on. And on the, the actual selvage edge, it says that it's a warm iron, two dot symbol, or it says if you can wash it at 40 degrees P, I think P is no bleach. I'm not quite sure I'll have to um, remind myself on that. Anyway, um, a warm iron and you hold it for 15 seconds with a damp cloth over the top of it. So you're not putting the, the iron directly on it. So the fusible side goes onto presumably the back of your fabric. Yeah, you are going to get a damp cloth. You're gonna put a damp cloth over it. You are going to hold the iron on it for about 15 seconds. Um, it, the suggestion is that you don't kind of iron it. You're not ironing it. You're just holding the iron on. So it'll take you a little while to move across a relatively large piece. And then 
it is suggested that you leave it for about 30 seconds before picking it up and starting to work with it to allow the adhesive to really set. So that is my answer on that. Did I do that in two minutes? I don't know. <laughs> David's not ready. I wasn't ready. Okay, well done. Thank you for the prep. Okay, so the next question is from Maureen Dahl, and she says, this is not a question. And there's a picture that goes with this. Um, So she sent us a smiley face. No, seriously, 951 blocks. I mean, that's a light. There, no, she's got 50 uh, for 20. No, really, we need more clarification on this because although we we think you're absolutely amazing, we also think you're mad. <laughs> <laughs> but oh, uh, Maureen, I don't know where you are in the world, but um, in. I don't know whether they could hear me actually because I have my. Oh dear, who didn't get the question? So, <laughs> sorry, I'm pressing the wrong buttons. You may not have heard the question um, because, let me, you get echo. Oh, there's buttons I have to press to stop echo and all sorts of things. And I thought I was being clever. This was for Maureen Dahl and she said, I hosted block of the month for quilts for care leavers. And she was sent 951 12 and a half inch blocks. Um, and then she remembered to they they didn't assemble particularly well. And then she remembered to use Philippa's pinning method from the beginning project. And now they do fit, fit together. So that was the that was the that not was the question. Gist of it. But, but what we're just saying was that I, I can't believe it's nine hundred and fifty one blocks. That is just the most. That's like I don't know how many quilts. That's 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 like dozens and dozens of quilts if you put all of those together. But Maureen's doll, which is D A H L. Now um, I have a lady that comes just once a month um, to um, clean just for a few hours to do the bits that you never do and she's from she's a whole girl and instead of it's a whole thing of you you might have come across this david so she always calls me doll which is short <laughs> for darling so she says would you like me to clean this for you doll so so now you see so you are more in darling i'm afraid <laughs> oh not afraid really that's really nice isn't it okay next question number seven okay see if we can get all the right buttons for sound this time sorry about that um so this is from Deborah Ward. She said she would love to watch live, but it will be right in the middle of her workday. Yeah, we're sorry about that. We we do our best, but we can't manage for everybody. Um, is there any chance that Philippa will be attending the AQS show in Paducah next month? Please tell, tell her I'm thoroughly enjoying the classes. Um, her enthusiasm for teachers is ama as amazing as her talent. Philippa, are you going to be at AQS? Okay, so Debbie, can I just say we're also in the middle of our working day, so we're with you on that one, so you don't need to feel alone. Uh, thank you for your question. Um, so the show, Paducah show, is in Kentucky. It's always in April. It has been running for several decades. It is a wonderful show where the whole town gets involved, and if you ever get the opportunity, it is well worth a visit. They have lots of events going on, and the National Quilt Museum, which holds three of my works, and so hopefully one of them will be on display during the show they quite often have best of show winners and and the quilts that are in there of mine have won major prizes at that particular um show over the years so um debbie I don't know whether you've been before, but do go and say um, hi to my quilts and all the other wonderful quilts. I've got most fantastic quilts in the museum. I will not be going. I haven't done any travelling with the exception of one trip to Houston since um, we had the COVID pandemic. I kind of reassessed my life and also this um, work from home here had really taken off. And at the moment, I... I have to say I did it for kind of 15, 16 or more years um, and it is really, really hard work doing travelling. I used to travel for about five months of the year. I'm not ready to go back to it yet, so I'm not saying I'm not going back to it, but at the moment um, I'm enjoying sleeping in my own bed, but only when I change the sheets. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, right, I've pushed the right buttons this time, I think. So, the next question is from Helen M. Kiltzer, and Helen's got a good question. This is one I haven't heard before. Um, Helen is saying, can I use clear nail polish instead of fray check to keep certain seams from unravelling? I do not like the residue left behind with fray check, and nail polish seems to do the same job without any telltale signs of its presence. And that's from Helen Kiltzer. Okay, Helen, you can use anything you like to seal the edges of your fabric as long as it works for you. I have absolutely no problem with that whatsoever. What I wonder is if the nail polish is working really well for you because you've got a little br brush and you can really direct it where you want it. The fray check is a nozzle and that is not the one that I've been using which might be over there. Anyway, um, I never squeeze a drop of fray check or I never use it like that. Um, you, you make a little hole in it. I always dip a pin in it and pick up some of the product on a pin and just kind of trail it along the edge um, because you do get a kind of hard lump if you actually squeeze out a little drop. So I wonder if it's more about the application than the actual product um, but I've got some other things here this is a, a local one and this is called incredibly tacky I hope that I am never incredibly tacky because that's not the that's not what I'm aiming for but it's really good it's more like a kind of um, a bit like Elmer's glue PVA it's a bit of a thicker product however at great expense I have just bought this which is Loctite vinyl fabric and plastic um, glue which I saw being used on a program about the Victoria and Albert Museum and they were doing some repairs on one of their textiles and I thought my goodness if that's good enough for the Victoria and Albert Museum I'm going to get some of that but it did cost me over £12 for this tiny little tube here but I'm interested to see how that works it might be really great on things like um, lampshade making that kind of thing so Whatever you think works, um, you can use. I'm, I'm not going to tell you there are any rules because there aren't. Okay, um, sorry, I'm just... Right. There we go. Okay, so we've got a picture with this one. Um, and hopefully you can still hear me, even though there's a picture up. Um, because I've pressed the right button. So this is from... Who is this from? This is from Laura... Porter, and Laura says, how many nine inch blocks does it take to make the top of a twin sized quilt? I'll be adding two one and a half inch borders and a wider border after that, but I'm not sure how wide the outer border should be. I don't have a pattern, only a photo. And then she says, these are the blocks I have finished and that's what we can see in the photo. So Philippa, right. how many nine inch blocks and does it make? Okay. Does it take? Okay, so I, I, there, if you Google this, you will get measurements that will tell you what the average twin size quilt measures. But I'm not sure that that is my, what I would use as my starting point. Um, what I would do is I would go and measure the bed and I would start at the point where I wanted the edge of the quilt to be. And then I would measure up one side, across the top of the bed and down the other side. And I would do that in both the vertical and the horizontal direction because all beds are different. I actually have a really high bed and I cannot get a bought bed spread large enough to go from the floor all the way across and down I can't it was a lot of talk about my bed tonight isn't that also can hardly climb onto my bed either um, but anyway so I would need a much bigger quilt to cover that amount yeah than if I had a very low bed and likewise you know is this a bed for a child is it a bed for an adult if it's a bed for an adult does it have two big chunky pillows for example do you want it to go from the floor up the the, the end of the bed all the way along the top of the bed and then over two big chunky pillows you know there's going to be very different measurements so I would start with my measurement 
done I would determine or as you already know the size of your block and any sashing and I would see how many blocks I would get into both my horizontal and my vertical direction and I would also take into account any borders that I was going to add and I would work it out that way so I know that that is not giving you a kind of a formula or you need x number but you're going to make a much better more successful nicer looking better fitting in the room quill if you do what i suggest rather than just pick a random size um, from the internet okay so that is how i would approach it <laughs> I'm talking too quickly because David's not, not I'm doing some up. research. Yeah. I was doing some research for the next question. Okay, sound on, me on. Um, question from Patty Sherman. Um, Patty comes from Oregon. She says, um, I'm wondering what Philippa's design wall is made from. So that's the wall at the back that you can see um, with all the stuff on it behind Philippa. Um, how does she get her works in progress to stay up? Thank you, I love the classes. Okay, um, and by the way, I'm sorry that I didn't say, sorry, who, uh, Laura, I didn't say how beautiful your blocks were looking and how fantastically dramatic with the really good use of light and darks, really sharp um, piecing there. So it's going to be a fantastic um, twin size or large twin size quilt when it's done. Right, moving back to Patty. Patty, my design wall is made from core board, sometimes called foam board, and it is cardboard or cardstock if you're in the States, a sandwich either side of a foam fill. It's six millimeters thick, so about a quarter of an inch, but you can buy it thicker. You can get very large sheets um, online, on the internet. You often have to buy about a dozen of them, but they're just hot glue gunned onto the wall um, and they just butt up to one another and I pin into it. So there is no fabric or um, kind of fleece or anything over the top of it. I just pin into it. If I pan up, they might be able to see the size of the... the yeah, walls. it goes all the way up to the ceiling. You get much bigger ones than that you can get really huge ones they're about a one size i think i think they're a on well, they might be yeah i think they're a one um that wall has been there for 16 17 18 years something like that i mean i don't do a lot of work but i do pin things into it all the time and it's still going strong so it, even though the kind of cost initially is quite high it lasts a long time it is really useful i wouldn't be without it was it your were you doing the glue gunning or was peter doing the glue we gunning? did it together you? you have to when you're glue gunning it does set very quickly so you kind of all over and then quickly get it up there so and we we can actually work quite well together sometimes <laughs> Right, okay, um, the next question is from Susan um, Schlobom, I think your name is Susan, apologies if I've got, if I've got that wrong. Um, and Susan says, I know Philippa likes a hard surface for pressing, um, but have you ever tried a wool pressing mat and what do you think about it? Okay, yes, I have tried a wool pressing mat, um, and particularly when I teach in shows, they're quite often um, supplied by um, the manufacturer or a retailer to encourage students to buy them when they have um, used them in a show situation. I do think they're good, but I think it, it kind of is what, what are you comparing it with? I like the hardest surface possible, and my ironing surface, which is um, a wooden ply board ironing surface with one layer of washed cotton batting stapled over it and then a layer of um uh, of a strong canvasy fabric lay over that is really really firm it's firmer than a wool um, pressing mat and so it gives me crisper results but if you've come from a really spongy kind of just add on you know um one of those shiny silver um, ironing board covers and then you go to a wool mat it's a kind of revelation but if i invited you all around and then you had to go on my cutting on my ironing board that would be a step up as well so yeah i think they're a, i think they're good but i like what i've got better because it is just firmer okay okay so that's good the next question is from leslie minshaw and uh, leslie says hi i'm a complete beginner to quilting what features in a mid-price sewing machine should i look out for um i thought your last quilting question time was very informative now i'm going to give you an answer to this one and then i'm going to hand back to philippa but i've just checked and we did a 15 minute video which is on youtube uh, where we give you 14 different i think it is 14 different things that you need to 
Um, oh, 18 factors to consider when choosing a sewing machine. So I would definitely have uh, a look at that video, preferably after the live is finished. You know, sort of <laughs> out. But, but we cover that in detail. But Philippa will probably give you a summary of, of those answers now. And so to find that, David, people just need to go to YouTube and... You just click on the Quilters Question Time uh, logo on Philippa's face and then click in videos and, and they'll be able to see it in there. Yeah, so if you haven't had enough of us by the end of this session, you can have more for free. Okay, so um, I do think it's such a big thing and there are so many different models and types available. I think it is really hard and I think you really need to do your research. And I always say go to the sew machine shop with samples and let them know beforehand you're coming to make sure they've got time for you to um, sew on it with the fabrics that you've bought and possibly the threads that you've brought with you so that you can really get a feel for the sewing machine. I mean, clearly the most important thing is price, isn't it? I do like a heavy machine, you know, little machine that's gonna go judder around on the table is gonna move and that's gonna make things hard. It's not gonna have a big strong motor so it's not going to be able to do really hefty work you know big quilts are gonna is gonna struggle with those I think a needle down function is really important so every time you stop sewing your needle goes down into your work it stops you getting steps in the line of stitching I think being able to change the feet easily is really advantageous I think you need to check that there are a good range of feet available in addition to what you are supplied with and you've always got good visibility at the needle point if you watch all of our classes you will virtually never see me using a foot that has any kind of metal bar across the front I'm always using some kind of open toe foot so that I can really see what I am doing I love the knee lift system which is a lever that you nudge with your knee that lifts and lowers the presser foot some people don't like it but I really love it uh, what else do I really like and um, some sewing machines are very kind of bulky front to back some are quite slim and some are very bulky and some have a very kind of built out um, section on the front where you assist and they'll have a straight bit and then it'll dip underneath and then the the foot is kind of hidden under there and and it's really hard to see because you've got all this stuff in front of you so when you sat look and see can I see what I'm actually sewing without actually having to do this I think people never consider that but look at the profile end on and see what the shape is the flatter it is the better your visibility is at the front I think um, off the top of my head that's as much as I can think of David's telling me to move on you've got a YouTube video to watch at some point so next question oh, there we go so we've got a couple of comments come in so Maureen Dahl who um, was the lady who had made who had received 951 blocks she says she's made 23 quills so far from 951 blocks and somebody else said some some Q4 CL hosts receive even more blocks than that Marion said that so um, yeah, the mind boggles at that. Um, and Laura Porter, um, who we was asking the question about the, the 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 bed, says thank you for answering my question. Love your classes. So thank you for that. Okay, the next question is from Christine Marsh, and Christine says um, I have recently had a try at shadow applique. Um, so far, we haven't done a class on shadow applique, have we? Like? Not. So far, my attempts have been very simplistic. Have you used this technique, and if so, how do you become more creative and successful in the final results? Okay, so shadow applique is you have a background, and generally you fuse your applique shapes onto the background, and then you put a sheer layer of fabric on top, so something like a silk organza or a man-made um, alternative to that, or cotton or gandhi, so that you can see your applique fabrics through the sheer fabric but they are somewhat muted now when the top layer goes on you would then satin stitch or blanket stitch or do some stitching through all the layers to trap your applique inside I have done similar but instead of applique did it particularly with a, a strip weaving technique where we were weaving fabric and creating designs through weaving and then adding little elements like all kinds of things like sequins all sorts of things and then putting the sheer fabric on top of that we were using all kinds of very sheer net and um, yeah organza type fabrics and then stitching and then adding more embellishment again and was a lot of fun um, 
but I like really precise work and it was a bit too kind of experimental for me I mean it's like everything the more you do um, the more the better you get at it the more complex the design comes and the more you do the more you learn not just technically about the process but also about design and what works well and what shapes work well and how what type of stitching you like to do on top of that what kind of shapes you like to stitch around you know don't like corners like curves all kinds of things like that um, so um, I don't actually in that sense have of, um, uh, tips to become more creative what I think is if that you are just a beginner at it you know look for um, designs that don't have to be applique designs you know children's coloring books can be really good anything like that and and you choose something that's simple then choose something more complex then go complex again and just see where it takes you and what you learn as you go along and then the bits that you like focus on those and the bits that are not your favorite bits um, then leave those behind so that's that thank you Christine Okay, so we're going to have a little intermission. Um, we, we've been thinking about what we would do for spring. And a couple of years ago, Philippa created a class um, on dimensional applique. So we've been talking about shadow applique. This is dimensional applique, which is three-dimensional. Um, and let me just um, switch to Philippa's. You can see, you can see that what we created there. So we have, I'm going to come back to me for a second. We have, um, we're going to do an offer on this class. It's normally 30 pounds or $40 and we're for the next two weeks to celebrate Easter and spring and things. We're going to uh, do it for 20 pounds and $25. So this is the first announcement that you will have heard that we're going to be doing this. It's a fantastic class. We were looking back through some of the comments that people have left on the class and people just love it. it it's absolutely, it's, it's really fun to make. It's, and it's, it, gives you beautiful results really easily so it's a, it's a and it's there's a lot of hand sewing in it so it's a nice one to be able to take on trips and that sort of thing with you as well we will be sending out an email tomorrow it will be on the website from tomorrow um, and it will be in facebook if you're in the face if you're a member and you're in the facebook group so um, have a look for that tomorrow if you would like to have a go and i'm just i'll put the picture up so that's what it looks like um, that was the original picture um, when philippa finished um, and here we have the Philippa holding her framed version of the same thing. It's a it's a lovely class, um, and uh, people have great fun doing it. Let's put that down. It's in a frame because we had it on the wall at the Festival of Quilts um, as in our exhibition space um, the last couple of years, which is why it's in, it's in that frame. We were quite amazed actually when we were just reading through the comments today. I was um, we were filming and I was sewing and David was just reading things out to me and every every comment was absolutely <laughs> glowing and seriously there were more than two. There were loads of them. There was about twenty. Or so. Yeah, there were. <laughs> okay, so. So that's that. Um, the next question is from Deborah. Now I think it's Gluzak, um, but there's several S's and two Z's in there. So hopefully I've got that right, Deborah. Deborah has a question about squaring um, fab fabric um, for a background. And she says, if you're using one piece for the center width and a second piece to be divided to add each side of the center, do you square the center piece and then square the piece to be used for the two sides and then join? Or how, how do you do it? She's basically saying, how would you do the squaring up for those two pieces that you are joining? And that's from Deborah. Okay, Deborah, I'm not quite sure that I'm going to answer what you want me to say there, really, because when I am um, piecing fabric for the back of the quilt, I always make it quite a lot bigger than the finished size of the quilt. Um, generally, I'm doing free motion machine quilting, but I don't actually think it matters whether it's free motion or regular hand quilting or regular straight stitch. Um, I like to have something to get hold of at the end, and I think that the quilting kind of can distort things and, and change the shape, and so I don't actually um, worry too much whether the back the backing fabric is square um, until after I've got all the quilting done and I'm ready to put the binding on it is at that point that I square it up but just to say what I do is let's say it's quite a big quilt and I've got um, twice the length that I need um, for my backing so I'm going to have a single piece in the middle and a half width strip on either side I'll just lay it out on a table and maybe even on the floor and then get a big quilting ruler and square and you can just draw a line just to make sure that from the fold to the selvage is generally folded in half um, so I've got two selvages together and a fold I will just with scissors with shears cut the edge so it's roughly square and, and at both ends and then I'll, I'll cut 
one length in half lengthways to add to either side and I won't worry too much about it because I think the squaring comes later on so what I wonder is are you kind of squaring it up before you actually do any quilting which is not the way around that I go so not quite sure I've answered what you want but that's how I do it okay so we've got another comment coming now this this is the, the comment coming from Trix R6 so I don't know your name I'm afraid Trix R6, but um, Trix says, hello, Philip and David, I'm able to join you live tonight as I have a night off from teaching kickboxing as I have a cold. So I, I feel for you for, that you've got a, a night off for not feeling well. As we said earlier on, I'm feeling a bit groggy tonight. So you've tucked yourself away in your craft room. Now, I don't know whether we've got any other kickboxers out there. So this is a shout out to all, all the kickboxers. Philip has put a hand up. Of course, she's done kickboxing before, but there we go. So um, Philippa, tell us about your kickboxing. <laughs> all right, so when I lived in Saudi Arabia, which was um, 15 for 15 years and I left 20 years ago, um, women weren't supposed to work. But one of the things I did was I trained as an exercise instructor and did many training courses here um, in the um, UK um, when I was back on holiday and actually it's what taught me how to teach and the thing that I remember most um, clearly was doing a course well I remember many things but I remember doing a course and the instructor that was training us was saying when you are teaching this is not about your workout because lots of exercise instructors do this is not about your workout you are working as hard as everybody else but you are teaching them how to do their exercise you are not exercising with them and it absolutely stuck with me and also doing that gave me great confidence because I used to teach ex-military guys and I'm very tempted to get up and do a roundhouse <laughs> kick <laughs> um, but I, I'm not going to do that I think I should practice before I do that because it's been some time um but yeah or everything feeds into everything else i should have known shouldn't i of course philip has done kickboxing i should have known so um the next question and um Trix is, has given us a smiley face so that's good tricks we have got nobody else coming forward to say that there are, there are other kickboxers in the house so um this is from julia kirby jones um, and Julia says, um, I have a Benina 807 that is 50 years old, but stitches beautifully. Um, unfortunately, it is only possible to thread spools vertically. Can you suggest a way to adapt for threads that are best used horizontally, or should I give up and only use upright spools? And that's from Julia Kirby Jones. Right, so very quickly, it, the theory is that the regular spools like this that have straight round thread go on the upright pin because they need to turn to come off and then the cross wound thread like this goes on the horizontal pin because the spool, the bobbin doesn't need to turn or rotate for the thread to come off. Okay, now I worked for many, many years with sewing machines that only had upright pins and 99 times out of 10 regardless of the type of thread that I'm using it will be on the upright pin and I've just been using whoops a cross wound thread on the upright pin but what I absolutely think is fantastic and that everybody should get regardless of whether they are Bonina um, sewing machine owner or not is this little foam disc so it's a spongy foam disc and it's got a plastic disc on the bottom and when your thread sits on that it is fully supported but the plastic turns really well and your thread feeds off brilliantly without that the threads do not spin that little bit of, of felt that you will have with your sewing machine um, Julia isn't uh, isn't going to cut the mustard but the other thing you can do is you can get yourself a, a thread feeder so this is a homemade one but you can buy them online and so the thread which one shall I put on it might not go on oh so the thread goes on there and it goes through here and then you thread it through your sewing machine and that will any thread will feed off really easily like so so you don't need to do anything other than buy one of these keep doing what you're doing end of next one David <laughs> I'm just reading about all these sports that people are playing now. So we've, we've got Louise Jessup says that she was a county standard fencer. Wow. Um, plus a county standard hockey goalkeeper. So we've got lots of lots of sporty people as well. And Trix, Trix is saying, can we do a, a, a what does she say, um, a martial arts and craft retreat, please? So, yeah, we'll think, we'll think about that one, I think. Um, 
but not very hard, unfortunately. So the next question is from Catherine Winter. And Catherine says, I'm curious as to how you select a specific machine quilting pattern for small baby quilts. I've been doing a number of baby quilts and I know that I don't need to send this out to a long arm quilter. Do you have any suggestions or best practices for simple small quilts? And that's Catherine from New Jersey. Okay, Catherine, good question. I'm just gonna swank here actually, which is not a thing that I tend to do very often, but just while we're on it, I know I'm supposed to be getting through questions. I remember doing a course and it was learning to teach, it was exercise to music, so basically aerobics, and it was a two week course that I did. And we had a written, we had a written exam to do as part of our qualification. And I went to see the, the tutor, said, you've done really well, you've got 99 out of 100, let's see where you went wrong. And so we had a look through it all and she said, oh, I've marked it wrongly, you got 100 out of 100. <laughs> so anyway, enough of that. Now then, a baby quilt. The, the quilting wants to be secure because it's obviously going to be washed and used, so you don't want kind of a minimal amount of quilting, but you don't want any special quilting because it is going to be washed and it's not likely to have a really long life, is it? you know hopefully the person's going to use it and if they have a second baby you make them another one um, I do think that our beginner class is quite useful for that we've got some um, machine quilting using the walking foot with straight lines and wavy lines that anchor the layers together nicely add another little interesting dimension but are not kind of overdone I would keep it I would keep it relatively simple so I, I, I wouldn't be doing any kind of extensive free motion or anything like that I might do a nice big stipple in a variegated thread you know might um, add in one or two bits of free motion but I might do quite a lot of just regular straight stitch with a slightly longer stitch length um, there are a number of classes that will help you particularly from series two quilt as desired it gives you loads of information as to how to look at what's going on in your quilt to take inspiration from the print or the, the shape of blocks that kind of thing to um, develop um, patterns from that and it talks about all kinds of things like using different stitches on your sewing machine so you could do some lovely wavy lines with you know like there's like a fly stitch that does things like that lots of interesting things so um, if you really want to explore it in depth I would really recommend that class thank you David okay so Louise Jessup of um, who says she was a counter-stand fan. She, she also said that she missed us at the Stitch Festival. Yes, we were at the Stitch Festival in London last year. Um, we very much enjoyed it, but it, commercially it wasn't a very good um, show for us in that sense. We love meeting everybody. So we have decided this year we're just going to be focusing on the Festival of Qu Quilts in Birmingham in the first week of August. So we will have our usual stand there, but we're not at any other uh, festivals or um, shows this year. Okay, the next question is from Simon. Sandra Buttrick and Sandra says um, hi this is my latest quilt and I will give you the picture um, I wasn't going to add a border but if I do the, the binding with three and a half inch which I just love I will lose my points uh, don't look too closely I've lost a couple of points anyway um, <laughs> back to the precision piece in class how would I rectify that for next time? And that's from Sandra. Okay, Sandra. So for those of you that don't know, I like a half inch wide finished binding, which means I'm cutting the strip at three and a half inches. And so when you're sewing the binding strip onto a pieced block, you're taking a half inch seam allowance and that's going to chop off any points where you've got just a quarter inch seam allowance. But I show you exactly how to deal with that in <laughs> piping and binding version two, which you must have in your library if you are a member because it's the first class of season one it is the first class yeah. isn't it yeah so um please watch piping and binding version two it will show you exactly how to deal with that basically it involves adding a little bit extra onto the wadding the batting and the backing and um just kind of sewing your binding on a little bit further out but it's all perfectly doable you don't need to do anything difficult or special and we have the answer in your library Okay, so we're nearly two thirds of the way through the questions. We're oh so nearly God. eleven twelfths of the way through our time, but we'll we'll keep going for now. We'll keep going. So the next question is from Scylla, uh, and Scylla says, "When cutting strips of folded fabric, what must be done to avoid the little bump where the fold is?" I'm sure I can remember Philippa mentioning it somewhere, but not sure where. Thank you, Scylla. Um, so Scylla, and what did Scylla say? All her pencils are really sharp. Oh. <laughs> It yeah. was Scylla, wasn't that, it? I think that was a, um, 
last yes last month Silly was asking about um pencil sharpeners and i recommended that she bought an electric not a battery operated pencil sharpener and i believe she's done that and her pencils so are really yeah to I die for really yeah okay so what i think Silla is referring to is when you're cutting multiple strips from a large piece of fabric you've say got it folded selvage to selvage you've got the fold at the 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 edge closest to you and the selvage away from you you cut several strips and they're kind of okay initially and then you tend to get a slightly v'd um, section uh, not really a problem too much if you are then cutting that further into units but then you do have a little bit left at the fold where you've got that little kind of um, pointy bit I think it is quite remarkable really I mean I've done it myself that you know you square up your fabric on your cutting mat and we do show you this in precision piecing and probably in the beginners class and you cut several strips and it just seems to to go and it's not square again and I think the only way around it is to after three four five strips is to check that your fabric is still um, at right angles and just square up again and keep doing that and then that is the only way that I have found to to eliminate that problem so I hope that is as successful for you Scylla as the pencil sharpener <laughs> okay. okay we're cracking on so the next question is from Sharon Tooby and Sharon says um, how does Philippa quilt her happy hearts wall hanging and she's got a picture of hers here um, I recently completed mine and the videos were fantastic I've done very little um, um, free motion quilting, so I'm leaning towards quilting with my walking foot, but not sure what would enhance it. Um, what would you suggest? Oh, she says she's learning to get to grips with her new Benina. What would you suggest, Philippa? Okay, so first thing, Sharon, you've done a lovely job with this quilt. It looks really beautiful. It's one of our most popular classes, yeah. isn't it? And the first thing I'm going to say to you is that um, we do have a gallery of projects that students have completed, and there are many, many Happy Heart projects that have been quilted um, in a variety of ways. So I would really have a look at that and get some inspiration from there. My Happy Heart wall hangings, there are um, two completed samples and then various just blocks in the middle none of them are quilted because they didn't do that in the class but I think that I chat about it in Quilters Desired actually um, so again I'm going to put I'm going to point you to Quilters Desire because it, it shows you how to take inspiration from what you've got there so you've got lots of hearts so you know if you wanted to do a little bit of free motion you could put some hearts into that you know you could continue that heart li that line down with some free motion hearts now if you made them sort of quirkier hearts and they weren't so symmetrical you know if you were not very good in your wobbled a bit they would be good um, you've got kind of offset squares so you could think about you know could I use squares in there you know if you want to do straight could you have quirky squares could you have them slightly overlapping could they go into background areas could they go into the border in a contrasting color um, so so just have a look at what you've got going on there have a look at our, our gallery of all the ones that have been made and if you do have the Quilters Desired class from season two or you do want to buy it, I think you would find it really worthwhile. Um, so that's where I'm going to point you for that, um, Sharon. Okay, so the next question is from Maria Burton. Um, and Maria says, I often see pictures or structures like a stained glass window or a land building or a landscape, which I'd like to make into a pattern for a quilt, but I've got no ideas how to do it. I really like geometric block type patterns how would you start to plan a quilt pattern, Philippa? <laughs> That's such a hard question for me. It's just not something I enjoy at all. I don't know if you know that I never do kind of pictorial quilts or representational quilts or, you know, anything like that. Um, but I would start with photographs. I would have many photographs and I would really study them. And I, I, you know, if you really want to do this well, I think you need drawing lessons. I think you need to learn how to draw. And if you want to use um, buildings, windows, landscapes you need to learn about perspective which is a kind of it's quite a big subject we do actually cover some perspective in a relative degree of depth yeah. don't we in the sashing and pieced border is it yeah, yeah sashing and pieced borders is sashing attic windows and pieced borders um, and I talk about true perspective in that and I show you how to do it so if you've got that class that's certainly a really good starting point um, but it, it is something that 
if you want to do it really well, you've got to have that background knowledge, really. You know, it's like, I always think that if you want to be an art quilter, it's a really good idea to have a grounding in traditional quilting to show you how things go together and what works, and then you can take that in any direction you want. Um, you know, somebody like Picasso, who did all kinds of experimental work, was actually a fantastic draftsman, and if you asked him to draw kind of from life, you would get the most wonderful representation of what he was seeing that you absolutely would recognize before he moved on so um, photography photography learning photography and um, learning to draw and learning to um, how perspective works is if I was going to pursue that that is where I would go probably not what you wanted okay, to do we'll have to Philip as husband is an artist yeah. and a sculptor so maybe we'll have I don't think we'd ever pin him down for long enough but <laughs> we, we we'd get him a class that he'd be the right person to do the class because he's a good teacher as well um, but I don't think that's going to happen I'm afraid so hopefully that is helpful Maria um, right we are um, the next question is from Jan Castles um, I'm not sure whether we're going to be able to cover this one I'm going to uh, well, we, we might very quickly okay yeah. so the question is Jan has a very solid oak top table and she wants to make a cover with dropped edges and she wants to know how to do, to, to do the design so that the edges go around the top of the table. How would you approach that, Philippa? Okay, I would go to our cushion class and in our cushion class it shows you how to make cushions with gussets. So you want your, your table top and then the flange bit that is going to go around the edge is the gusset without another piece of cushion stitched on the other side. I absolutely think that's where you need to go. At the Festival of Quilts we had a little kidney shaped dressing table with a glass top and I did exactly that with it, yeah. didn't I? And they've um, the bit that dropped down over the side had a shaped edge and it was all piped it looked really nice didn't it um, and I did I quilted it so I had um, I had three layers I had my it was actually a velvet fabric on the top and then I had wadding and then I just had a cotton fabric um, but absolutely the cushion class will show you where to go with that um, and uh, yeah it, it's going to answer your questions Okay, so the next question is from Kay Johnson. Um, what size? She's new, Kay says she's new to quilting. What size quilting ruler do you advise? Uh, there are so many sizes. I'm finding it confusing to know what to buy. Okay, so that is from Kay. Kay, spend how much money you've got to spend. Um, I do want you to look quite carefully at different brands because not all rulers are designed equal. And if you start to look as if you were to get three or four different brands of six or six and a half inch squares together and look at them you would be able to see that some of them you can read them really easily and the the, the lines seem to make sense and then others will have just a multitude of lines and they all look really confusing and it, it's just too much i personally like omni grid and omni grip they're not the only ones by any means but that's what i like i think that one of the most useful rulers when you make traditional blocks is a six inch by 24 inch which is that one i think you need a small square and this one is six and a half inch a six and a half inch square is much more useful than a six inch square so i personally would buy that i use this little one by six inch ruler all the time for checking little measurements and um, just yeah really easy really handy to get hold of and if you were going to buy one more um, square in addition to that I would get a 12 and a half inch square not for squaring up your blocks I don't want you to square up your blocks but it is quite useful for bigger pieces so that is my answer on that we do actually David we, we do, do sorry we do have a beginners um, uh, kit kind of what to buy don't we on the website yeah, yeah under it's the Q &A, in, under Q &A in the, in the quilters. lots of information in that Q and A on the um, website so don't forget that's there okay so the next question is from Kathy Kelly and Kathy wants your scissor recommendations please Philippa Karen K Buckley any size love them all I've got every single one they're not all here 
The ones I use the most often are these medium sized um, blue handled ones. Um, they're really soft, squashy handles, easy to use, but they're, they seem to cut really well and the tip will be really accurate with small snips. You know, it seems like quite a big scissor for really accurate small snips, but it does work really well. Um, I've got applique scissors all sorts, but if I was going to, me personally, going to have only two pairs, I'd have an 11 inch pair of shears and I'd have these Karen K Buckley um, blue scissors. So that's what I'd have. Great, that's the <laughs> fastest I've ever heard Philippa answer that question, so that's great Philippa, thank you. Um, next question is from Susan Waterton, um, and Susan says, I don't seem to be able to sew a straight quarter inch seam. What is the secret? I seem to either start in the wrong place or tail off at the end. Okay, so um, I don't like quarter inch feet with guides. I don't think they're accurate. I think they get in the way. I think they can push your fabric and I think they stop you feeding your fabric in. If you are working on a Janome or a Brother, you need this foot, which is the Janome clear plastic quilting foot and guide set. You don't need the guide, but this is much better than the metal foot that is supplied with those sewing machines. So your foot can make a really big difference to your visibility and how the work feeds through. I think you need a straight stitch plate. If you don't have a straight stitch plate, there is play in the work. We chatted a little bit about that at the beginning of the class. A straight stitch plate makes all the difference. The work doesn't get pushed down the hole. It's held more securely as it goes through. I can tell the difference between when I've got it on and when I haven't got it on. On, I really can okay I think that a fine needle makes a difference if you're using a big thick wadgy needle it pushes the work down the hole and it stops you being accurate I think if you are piecing with anything bigger than a 70 needle it is too big these are fine fabric smaller seam allowances you don't need a whacking great big needle you want nice fine thread as well I never use cotton thread it's inelastic and bulky okay uh, at the moment I'm using 100 weight silk in the top and bottom line 68 polyester in the bobbin okay you um, might be advised to start and finish with a leader strip and you'll see me use this in the precision piecing class it's a double folded piece of fabric that I stitch onto at the end of operation so that when I finish however much chaining I'm doing whatever I'm doing I sew onto this little double folded leader strip and so the um, threads are secured the foot is already slightly raised and I can just start stitching and feed the next bit in I'm going to feed in much more accurate I'm not having to lift the foot or anything just feed in watching the edge of the foot uh, and then it w I won't get any snarling make a big difference and when you get to the end if you're not chaining another similar unit on put another leader strip through and you've set up again and you will maintain consistency the gap between the leader strip and the unit is just two or three millimeters so there's no place for things to move about it keeps everything more accurate watch precision piecing again it's full of that kind of information Okay, thank you. A couple of comments about that. Um, well, Louise Jessup commented about the rulers, saying she hates the half inch down the edge of the ruler, the number of times she gets it wrong, and she's put grr. <laughs> so, okay, I'll just chat about that. Okay, well, let me just finish the comment. And then she says she loves the Omni Grid and the yellow markings. It's really easy to see rather than black. So thank you Louise and that's a really good point because um, this is a six and a half inch square but the numbering starts with a full inch so I'm reading a full inch one inch two inches and so on and the half inch is on the outer edge if you start with a ruler that has a half inch and then it's got a half inch and then you've kind of got one and a half inches that is hopeless that is what Louise says I hate it too make sure that whatever you ruler you buy that has got an extra half inch is on the the outside of the ruler not on the start of the ruler thank you for reminding us about that Louise that's important information okay and then we've got another comment from Sarah Ronicles who says the straight stitch plate is a game changer so thank you for that it Sarah it certainly is Sarah and um, Karen Hansen says about the scissors just don't get your Karen K Buckley scissors too close to the iron because they melt <laughs> so I'm, I, yeah, we'll, we'll ask no more questions Karen um, and um, Oh, Ad Heads, who I don't know who that is, says you're going to get a speeding ticket, Philippa. So yes, Philippa is definitely <laughs> speeding up as, uh, as we go. So the next question, we've got a couple more questions to go. Um, I'm going to skip the one about the ironing board. Um, I'm going to go to Deborah Chancellor and say, have you any experience with quilt appraisals? Our local quilt guild is holding a quilt show. 
um, and we'll have an appraiser available. The appraiser said insurance companies require an appraisal in case of loss. What do appraisers look for? How do they value the qualities of a quilt? Do you know, and David mentioned this question and I meant to, I've got a whole raft of appraisals um, in a drawer there because all of my exhibition quilts I have had appraised because often in a big show you will be offered the opportunity to have your quilt appraised. I've got quilts appraised at a value of $20,000 and uh, several kind of $18,000, that kind of thing. So... The um, the appraiser is looking at all kinds of things. So she's looking at the design of the quilt. She's looking at the quality of the make. She's looking to check that it's in good condition so that it doesn't have any holes. It's not covered in cat hairs, all of that kind of thing, because those things affect its value. She's also looking at a person as to whether they are a well-known quilter that has won prizes. So for example, if you are a well-known quilter that has won major prizes, your quilts have a greater value because you're more likely to um, have people wanting to buy them from you or museums and things buying them from you and so they command a higher price because they are of um they're more desirable in that sense i wish i'd got the appraisals out <laughs> can you chat a minute while i can you is there anything you can say while i can just see if i can dig one out do you yeah. mind no, sorry no, david sorry. I just, I might not manage it. Okay, but, um. so what I can do is I can tell you who the winners of the um, of the draw are. This is normally Peter's job, but as Philippa said, Peter is out at the show in Hull tonight. So um, he's out enjoying himself while we're working hard here in the studio, doing what we love to do, to be honest. So the winners of the, uh, the draw, you don't have to do anything to be in the draw. We just have a list of all our members um, and whatever the number that comes out uh, points to a specific member. So the two winners tonight are Sue Pike and Liz Sumner. And I will be sending you an email um, and asking for your um, home address and we will send the prizes to your home address as soon as we know what it is. Now, I don't know whether Philip is ready yet. Well, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. I've got this big fo this big box file here that's got all the appraisals and all the paperwork in it. Um, and I'm not coming up with an appraisal. Oh, here we go. Here is an appraisal. Oh, no, that isn't. Oh, I I'm not going to manage it. <laughs> I think we should um, chat about, Maybe try and remember time. it and chat about it next time because people might be interested to know. Yeah. Okay. Last two or three questions, David. Okay, yeah. Um, so there's one with a picture which I'll pop up shortly. This is from Pat Scriven. Um, and Pat says, um, I recently finished this baby quilt using advice from your precision piecing class. I was pleased with my points, but struggled to get an exact match where six seams met. Any advice on how to improve this in the future? So I'll see if I can get the picture. So it's a really pretty quill and um, looks really lovely and it does look beautifully made pat so basically um what pat has got there is um she's got quarter square triangle blocks all stitched together so what she's kind of creating on the diagonal are pinwheels if you can see that if you can look at the yeah. diagonal she's got pinwheels so she's actually got eight seams coming together there it's very similar to what we've got in the um, Le Moyne star the feathered star and Le Moyne star um, class that is in series two um, I, I tend to press all of the seams open um, I find that I can get much better matching without all the bulk if I press all the seams open so you've got a mix of kind of half um, of yours are pressed open and half of them are pressed to one side. I think that is always a really good idea whenever you're going to embark on anything like this to spend a little bit of time just making some samples and doing some pressing and just seeing what works for you. But I'm pretty sure that if I was going to make this, I would press all the seams open. Okay. okay I think that, I think we're going to we'll finish it there. Questions that we didn't yeah. manage to get to this time, we will, we will try and do next time. Okay, so yeah, well, th we thank you for all your questions and, and I apologise that we don't manage to get through them all. I mean, it is about entertainment as well as, you know, trying to make it a fun evening and um, not all about just um, getting through technical stuff. I mean, I hope that there's been some interesting stuff there that has given you some food for thought um, and perhaps for um, future exploration. What we must remember is that David is not feeling well and he's done really well to keep going. 
going um, for slightly longer than the um, scheduled time. So well done, David, and thank, thank you for you. that. So um, don't forget that offer's coming along. Congratulations to our two winners. David will be in touch. We'll get those things sent off to you. We'll be back with you towards the end of April. And again, we'll be asking you to send your questions in. So if there was anything um, that didn't get answered um, this time, please do send it for next time and we will do our very best. And if you put a little note saying, I asked this last time and you didn't answer it, we'll put it at the top of the list, okay? And you know how it goes, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. So from us here, we wish you a really wonderful um, kind of journey into spring and we will see you towards the end of April. Thank you so much for joining us. Bye from David. Bye -bye. And bye from me. 